Hello, I'm Sally Penny MBE, and welcome to a brand new episode of my Talking Law podcast. On each episode, you'll hear my conversation and interview with a leading figure in the law, from barristers like myself to solicitors, QCs, judges, managing partners, and more. I'm a barrister at Kenworthy's Chambers in Manchester and the Joint Vice Chair of the Association of Women Barristers. I'm also the founder of Women in the Law UK. You can find out more about what we do at womeninthelawuk.com. Today I'm talking with Amanda Pinto QC. Amanda was called to the bar in 1983 and practices at 33 Chancery Lane, London. She specialises in business wrongdoings, international fraud, corporate crime and money laundering. We started our conversation by discussing the values which led her into her career. I've always been really interested in rights and people being able to um, exercise their rights. And I've always wanted to help. I've been interested in how you manage to enable people to do what they're supposed to be able to do. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, I, I when I was at school, I loved history. Um, but I think what I like is a combination of a kind of academic side of it and the practical side of law. I don't think either of them on their own are enough. I think you need both. So that, that was why I thought law. And the second um, part is why a barrister. I, I'd never even heard of barristers, to be honest, when I was growing up, really. And um, I went to university and I studied law. And when I got there, everybody said, you talk so much, you must be going to be a barrister. And so I went, I managed to get a mini pupillage for a week at Devera Chambers, which I had no connection to. And I absolutely loved it. And it was just before I was going for lots of interviews to be a solicitor. Uh, and it really rather put the kibush on that because I, I thought I was going to be a solicitor. Wow. That one mini pupillage changed your life. <laughs> it did. It did. <laughs> one of the things that happened was that when I had all these interviews for solicitors firms, they said, so why do you want to be a solicitor and not a barrister? And I went, um... <laughs> I was totally unconvincing because really I didn't want to be a solicitor. Yes. Wow. And why your area of law? Perhaps people who don't know, can you just tell us where, how, what area you practice in and why you went into that? Because we have a variety. Well, I interview a variety of people on this podcast and it's so important just to get a gist of how certain areas you know, attract different people. Again, if I can go back to the beginning, because I really didn't know what I wanted to do at all. And uh, I was pretty sure what I didn't want to do. So I got a very general common law commercial pupillage. And it was a very, very different time. There were very few women at the bar. Uh, but it was at a time when I think people were trying to get a single woman into their chambers, perhaps. So it was possible to get pupillages. And I decided to go for a general common law commercial pupillage, really to keep my options open. But I was really sure I didn't want to do crime and I didn't want to do family. And I didn't get taken on in my first set. Uh, and literally by luck, someone in that set happened to bump into a friend of his who was in the next door building and they said, oh, we're desperate for pupils, we're desperate for tenants. Do you have anybody? And he said, yes, we've just said no to all of ours. So he asked, would I like to go for a pupillage interview or for a chat, actually? And I got on like a house on fire with that first person who I ended up sharing a room with for years. I then was interviewed by two people in the middle of chambers, one of whom became a fantastic pupil master, as it was then, to me, a re really fantastic person, and did a pupillage there. And what I really loved, so that was my third six, and what I really, really loved and hadn't really anticipated, which coming back to that university comment was a bit thick of me, actually, was I loved the advocacy. I loved going to court. I loved saying things on behalf of somebody and having the argument in court. And I went all over the place 
doing exactly that. And just the whole atmosphere in Chambers was just such fun and so vibrant from everybody's experiences. And, and that was a criminal pupillage. Years went by, general crime. And then there came a point when I was doing a lot of sex cases, which I hated. And it was stopping my career from moving forward, actually, because I couldn't take any fraud cases uh, because of the every few days or weeks, you'd have fixtures that meant you couldn't do any long trials or even, even I also did quite a lot of drugs work, which I really liked. And I, again, I couldn't do those longer um, investigation cases because because of my diary. So I stopped doing sex cases and I, I started doing more and more fraud cases and drug cases. And then I wrote a book on corporate crime. Yeah, and, and so basically my career is now corporate crime, fraud, bribery, money laundering. So sort of business crime. Yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's oh gosh, I, we're going to run out of time, aren't we? It's so interesting making that decision because, of course, so many women at the criminal bar get stuck in, I don't want to say a rut because it's important and valued work, which I myself do. But it, it is the same old type of work um, and the assumption. So to be able to make that decision, I just wondered where that confidence came from to just kind of just stop. So Sally, in, in my professional life, I've made a number of decisions which actually were probably started off as a feeling and accumulated to a point where I felt I really didn't have a choice. I was really quite unhappy with the way things were. One of those was um, actually not prosecuting uh, in East Anglia. And that was to do with career development as well. It was that I was spending my life going backwards and forwards on trains to East Anglia to do work that I could be doing in London for the same money without the train fares and all the rest of it, making it less productive. Um, the second one was in relation to sex cases. And actually, as I've said, I hated them. So it wasn't just, it was they're forensically, they're very difficult. They're very important cases. I had, well, I had three young children. It was when my youngest was four. I just thought enough is enough. I, I, I was finding it very, very hard to do lots of cases of sexual abuse on children with my own children there. And I just was very, very bad at leaving them at the office, if you know what I mean. So, um, and, and I specifically wanted to put my, um, move the direction of my career. So I think you said, I mean, it's interesting to hear you describe it as confidence because to me, it really was a decision where I was, I was actually pretty miserable. And I knew, I knew actually that it had to be all or nothing. So my clerks, when I'd said this, first of all, they were extremely unhappy, as they were unhappy when I said I didn't want to go to East Anglia to, to do ordinary work. But they did more or less not give me the work. And if they ever did, they'd sort of slip a bail application and I'd say, oh, but this, this seems to be um, a, a child abuse case. And they'd say, yeah, but it's a bail application. I said, I've still got to read it. I've still got to be on top of the whole brief. I don't want to do it. And it was a few questions, sort of issues like that, where they thought they could slip one under the radar, as it were. But um, <laughs> but I suppose I hadn't thought of it, as you're saying, as confidence. It just seemed to me that I, I really had to move the type of work I was doing. And it was a very unpopular move. Yes. Yes, particularly because you you were so successful. But I want to continue talking about some of your successes. I'm not going to run through all your cases. Uh, but what you're doing now, um, you've become the chair of the Bar Council, uh, as I've said, our professional um, uh, organisation. And there is a feel at the bar, on the circuit, that for a long time, Bar Council hasn't felt like our Bar Council, that you've got our back. And for the first time in a very long time, we feel that the Bar Council is doing stuff. And I want to just run through and just ask you really, because I get a sense that that's, you'll say, oh, it's not all me, but my sense is it is all you. 
uh, is that actually we feel kind of together. We're in a pandemic. We've got accusations of lefty activist lawyers. Uh, we've got um, Black Lives Matter um, allies. We've got leadership programs um, being you know, set up so that we can deal with the attrition uh, of not just women and the bar, but others. And so the field generally is actually the bar council is doing stuff. I mean, for my own personal thing, even the bar conference, which was online, was diverse. There was no wine, which is a constant complaint. So I just wondered, why did you become chair? And have you got a real hunger for change and impact? And is that why you, you took up the mantle? I'm going to pick my questions because you've asked quite a few in there. I know. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to go for the ones I want to go for. So first of all, can I say thank you very much? Um, I would say if if I were to look back on this year and say two qualities that I hope I'd brought to it um, in a year when, it, in my view, it needed it more than ever, was calmness and collaboration. And the third thing was uh, keeping the, the three things that I wanted to achieve in an ordinary year or set out, set out to try and achieve in an ordinary year to keep them on the agenda. And that was not necessarily always easy. And basically, they all centered around access to justice, access to justice for ordinary people, which at that point, funnily enough, when you think about the end of 2019, was keeping courts open, keeping legal aid uh, at reasonable rates and um, improving legal aid um, and access to justice. Secondly, access to the profession. So diversifying and modernizing the profession. And thirdly, um, keeping us open for um, business as a as a legal system and um, a place for dispute resolution in light of Brexit. So repositioning ourselves in the world and keeping our leadership position. So those were my ambitions. And I think the lucky thing for me this year has been that I have been in a position to push that agenda forward, even though we have been coping with a pandemic. And I've never lost sight, I think, of those, I hope, of, of those ambitions. So you talk about the Bar Conference. It's not a surprise that it was the most diverse it's ever been. And, and that's not just in relation to gender. It's employed barristers on panels with self-employed. It's um, people from different backgrounds of all sorts. Um, and that was deliberate. And I was very, very closely involved in organizing that because it really matters to me. Um, I, I think we are a better bar if we are more diverse. I think we're better for those who need us. And, and that's what we always have to remember is it's not really, it isn't about us. It's about who we are representing. And so, I mean, to me, this is all pretty obvious stuff. And I suppose that's been a, a, a positive in that it, none of it's felt forced or unnatural to me. It's all felt obvious. Uh, so I've never had to worry about how it might come across. In fact, I would say about myself that um, I'm not really, in one sense, a, a great ambassador for equality and diversity because it, it's just to me, I just feel like, why wouldn't you? How could you not? And I think that has been really, really great that somebody who just feels like that has been there in those discussions about COVID operating hours and how to get the courts back open safely and those pandemic specific issues. And I, I'm pleased that I was there to keep going on about the impact on diversity if we're not careful. Yes. Well, I was going to come to that. When I interviewed Joanna Hardy, who's a friend of mine, that's one of the things, and we sit on the Criminal Bar Association Social Mobility Committee, that is of grave concern that actually one of the consequences is quite simply going to be that 
diversity will be affected. People won't be able to afford to come to the bar. The incomes aren't there. The working hours for women, we were already in the operating hours consultation, which closes the day of recording. And so that is something that I'm concerned about, you're concerned about. But I just wonder, when people are like Alexander Wilson, as I have, are mistaken at court for defendants, do you think we're really making progress? What else can we do on diversity? Well, I do I do think we have made progress, um, but I have to say there is a huge amount more to do. And I think from every single aspect. So I think there's a lot to do with society. There needs to be societal change. That That's the first thing. But as I read, actually, <laughs> uh, on a flag at Glastonbury, if you think one per, one individual can't make a difference, try sharing a tent with a mosquito. <laughs> and, and I think it's so important. If the if the issue is enormous, that shouldn't mean that we don't deal with it. Um, so I think, first of all, we need to address what's wrong in the profession. We need to make deliberate, focused changes, and that's why. The Bar Council has this accelerator project, um, which originally came from an issue over different successes of men and women at the bar, but is obviously is is going to be rolled out far more widely in terms of race, etc. But but what it's dealing with is the barriers to entry, the barriers to progression, the fair allocation of work, the fair distribution of work. And everybody has a part to play in that. That's our lay client, our uh, professional client. So solicitors and working with the law society on this, um, clerks and practice managers. So we're working with the IBC and the LPMA, as well as barristers themselves. Because as you know, if you are representing somebody, say in a criminal case, and you've got a brief that suddenly becomes available for a co-defendant and you are asked who should go who should that go to there's got to be a way of doing this so that everybody gets a fair chance and it's not just oh well we had Sally last time she was great let's have Sally again we've got to think about every time we are redistributing work um, so that's internally but i think also we've got to recognize that as you alluded to where there are pressures on the system, and there are enormous pressures this year on the system in particular, you have got to make sure that the response to those pressures does not discriminate. So I think coming back to your earlier question, that's one of the things that I've been very careful to try to succeed in doing, that that aspect should not be lost in an immediate knee-jerk reaction to the pandemic. Absolutely. I'd like to move on and just sort of ask you a little bit more about you, really, Amanda. You know, you've we've got three children, you're in silk, you've got this great, stressful role. What do you do for well-being? Because let's face it, you know, people burn out of the bar. And the Bar Council has played, a, you know, a part in bar well-being in getting us all to think about our well-being. What do you do? I mean, there are some things I do. And one of the things I do is walk my dog, which I love. As anybody who knows me knows, my dog is very, very close to my heart. Um, and I was before this year, um, I, I'm quite I'm quite a greedy person and I really love cooking and eating. Um so, I, I mean, it, it really hasn't happened this year for obvious reasons, but I, I like um, having people over to supper. <laughs> and I really like cooking. And luckily, my husband's very good at providing delicious wine. So that's excellent news. Um, but, yeah, I think those are two of the things that I, I like doing. Um, but one of the things that has been very difficult this year is because – Social life has just so changed um, and in some ways disappeared. I think that's added to the stress enormously. I mean, the, the type of crisis that we're in, obviously every crisis has its own difficulties. If we were in a war, it would have different difficulties. But this has been, to state the obvious, a very isolating year. It's not the same being on Zoom and I think that's been very difficult. And it, it, it manifested itself, actually, because 
when we moved out of the bar council because effectively we could work from home and there you know the lockdown happened it wasn't that we can't do our job from my daughter's bedroom but it it does mean that it's just not as good it's not as good for well-being and i think you don't just you just don't get things agreed as easily actually so that, that's been a big a big impact i think this year and and i must say i i have missed court I've been yes. a couple of times, but I've missed court. Yes. Well, it's interesting, that, isn't it? Because judges started off very um, uncomfortable with the whole process, and some still are. And actually, the process of going to court, I think they're just pleased to see us. I, I find they're much nicer. Um, when, yeah, when right. Oh, I look forward to that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it is a very interesting thing as well, though, because it is very, very different for the judiciary, and it's different for mu- many court staff. Typically, they go in a different entrance. Their environment is very contained. They're not bumping into people that they don't know, and they don't have that fluid group of the public coming and going that we do on our side if you like on land side of the airport that is the court they're on air side and it's all a bit more um managed and i and i think that's a really important thing that i hope people appreciate when they're talking about listing something or um whether it should be in person or or remotely is actually it's not the same for those who are coming to the same environment day in, day out, and then practitioners, for example, who are going to one court centre one day and one court centre another, and having to get familiar with how things are working there and what is and isn't safe distancing in that particular court. But there is an argument, isn't there, though, about using the digital system for trials. Do you think it's time, as I've been considering, for us to look at a realistic position of using the online system to deal with some of the backlog? So I am a very big proponent of the jury trial system. Uh, I think David Lammy's report in effect says it all. Uh, And I worry very significantly about that being um, encroached on. That aside, um, I know from listening to people who sit as magistrates that they found it more difficult to hear trials, which was happening at the very beginning, yes. um, remotely. And I do wonder a bit about, um, just from my own experience of having had witnesses give evidence remotely in trials that I've done, obviously they've been occasional witnesses, um, just what quite what the impact is. But I think there is a disconnect in the same way that I was saying earlier, Sally, that if you and I are in the same room, it, it would just be different. And I, and I think there's something really positive about that. And I suppose the question is, is it better to have what is, to my mind, uh, and I may be wrong about this, a second best trial or no trial at all or to... <laughs> get more trials moving by getting more courtrooms um, open and all sorts of other individual bits yeah. of the system working better and, and have it in person, but perhaps with a bit of a delay. And I suppose the real question is, how long is the delay? Because if the delay is within a time frame that people think of as reasonable, then even if it's longer than they would like, I would probably prefer that it was in person. But coming back to the issue that you put forward, which is to do with legal representatives being able to attend court, that, that's a, in one sense a different issue. Um, because I'm talking about access to justice for the public. With this, I am sure that we should be trying our best as a system to ensure that the greatest diversity that we have already accomplished and want to continue to attract should not reverse. And so when we talk about the ways of reducing or dealing with a backlog, which, as you say, was there very significantly and deliberately put there and maintained, we need to be very, very careful that we don't 
reverse a position which, is, as you've said, has made incremental progress. But it takes nothing to put that into reverse. It takes very, very little, and it will be an enormous task to turn it back round. And, and, and I've seen it. I, I do remember, actually, with, with sort of naivety thinking when I came into the role, oh, you know, I'd like to do this, that, and the other. And, and I realized, <laughs> oh, even before the pandemic, I realized that actually all I could do was slightly move the direction of the tanker in the English yeah. journal. I, I wasn't going to be able to do a 360 uh, or a 180. Obviously, that was a bit of a depressing moment, but um, <laughs> but you've done. Will well carry it on. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you, you, well, you've done. You've done a lot more, as I as I say. Um, Amanda, I want to ask you about books. I always ask this also about fi- favorite fictional lawyer. I don't know why, because most of us don't watch things with fictional lawyers in. So true. That's so true. My relatives go, what do you think of Silk? And I go, I don't know. I've never seen it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Honestly, you know, my mother watches it. You've probably got relatives who like watching because they think it's your life. But yeah. I wonder if there's been it's a book at, at least which has really affected your life. And if you could share it with us, because we've got a book club. So it's nice to hear all the uh, uh, all the favourites of some of the guests on here. Do you have yes. a favourite book? My Desert Island Disc book is War and Peace. It's such a brilliant book. And I remember resisting reading it for years and years and years because it's so long and the and the names are so difficult. And it's everyone said, oh, and it's like, it's two bits of a book, you know, the, the war bits, you just got to skip over the war bits. They're very boring. But actually, actually what they did was to put in context two things. One, one of course, was the historical context, but the second is how people in those situations, how individuals um, are affected and how they how they behave. And I loved that. I loved the combination of huge kind of external events and individuals. And the, and I think it's a very I think that it's a very easy book to read. That that was the other thing that surprised me when I read it. It's it's just so beautifully written, and obviously you have to get the right translation. I can't remember which yes. one it is, but I will let you know. But it's, <laughs> it's it's a fantastic, fantastic book, and I've and I remember actually having then read Anna Karenina afterwards, thinking after about fifty or a hundred pages from the end of Anna Karenina, thinking I mustn't finish this because I'm going to be so sad when it finishes. And then I left it for so long I couldn't actually quite remember what had happened. So <laughs> that's not to be advised. <laughs> yeah, more of these, without a doubt. Yes. Um, Amanda, I, I've got some, two quick questions for you because we're running out of time. Um, the first question is whether you have any advice for perhaps young people entering the bar presently. I often say, you know, the, being a barrister coming to our profession, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And the same for women, you know, I set up a women's organisation so that we learn some skills that we didn't know and and so the question is really any advice for those entering the profession and perhaps any advice for retention what i would first of all say is be true to what you want um if you like me and be adaptable so if if like me you thought you didn't want to do crime and family and then there came an opportunity and it seemed to work be open to that opportunity I frankly couldn't have enjoyed myself more than I did doing all those different cases all over the country. And I've had some extraordinary cases that have just, you know, they're hilarious, actually, when you look at them from the outside um, in terms of the combination of factors. They were like they were like television um, series or something. And and also on the other side of it, that you really are helping people. So I think if there is if there's something that you think you want to do, do it. And if you stick at it for long enough, you will get there. You might not get there in the way that you thought you'd get there. And uh, I and I most certainly didn't. I I know people think that if you've somehow managed to get to a position where you're in a, in a leadership role that it must have been simple for you and you must have sort of, you know, got the ski lift up the mountain. But I can tell you, I was on snowshoes and I was zigzagging and um, on uh, quite often falling down. Uh, so 
that's the first thing. And the second thing is, I think if you've got a good idea for your practice or your professional life, then listen, it probably is a really good idea. And I, and I think it's a, to come back to something we talked about before. I, as I say, I made some decisions in my life, my professional life, to stop doing things and to concentrate on other things. And in the short term, I knew that they would affect me negatively, and they did. Equally, I was, I became more and more convinced that there should be a book, a practical book on corporate crime, and I couldn't work out why nobody had written it. And luckily, I uh, was introduced to Sweet and Maxwell, and I sort of pitched the book. Um, uh, which I've written with a colleague who's been fantastic. And um, I remember with the first book, which was incredibly difficult to write, actually, I, I thought it would be much easier than it was. But I I remember thinking, if we don't hurry up, somebody will publish one before we do. And nobody did, luckily. And, and so we've now literally got in our fourth edition. Our fourth edition will be coming out next year. and. Um, so it just shows you that if you've got what you think is a good idea, it probably is a good idea. Yes, yes. So, That's so, so helpful. And, and as far as retention is concerned, I very often, I'm afraid, had mothers at, I say the school gate, but the very occasional times when I've made it to school gates and been hanging about as opposed to running in, grabbing a mother child, which one hopes is one way and running out again. But um, – and they've said, oh, I wish I hadn't given up work. I wish I'd done what you've done. And what I think is you do give up a lot or you do have to make compromises. Um, but on the other hand, you have to do what's right for you. And if if you really want to keep at the career, which will give you so much. And I, I mean, I think being a barrister is a brilliant job. My children are bored rigid with me telling them all to be lawyers and they're all well, my advocacy hasn't worked, put it that way. <laughs> I think it's such an, a fantastic job because it's it matters, it's helpful, it's intellectually stimulating, and it's fun, if I'm allowed to use that word about it. It's, it's just enjoyable. Um, I mean, there aren't many other jobs that combine those, those four things. Gosh, it's good to reflect on that, isn't it? Even in the depths of late hours, drafting skeletons, the fun aspect. Amanda Pinto, that was amazing. Thank you for talking law with me, Sally Penny. Thank you for coming on, Amanda. I loved it. Thank you. A very big thanks to Amanda Pinto for her time today. I'd love you to get in touch and let me know what you think about the podcast. You can find me on Twitter and follow me at Sally Penny One, or just search for Sally Penny or Women in the Law UK on LinkedIn. There's a new Law and Guidance webinar series, and you can see this on YouTube, on the Women in the Law UK channel, or listen to it in podcast form. You can also search for Talking Law Book 1, 2 and Book 3, which will be available on Amazon from next month. Thanks to our production team, Sam Walker and Michael Blades at What Goes On Media. Bye for now. <laughs>